Presented by Caltech. Thank you, Cindy. And I'd like to add uh, my welcome to all of you to tonight's Watson Lecture. It's my pleasure to introduce my colleague in the Division of Chemistry and Chemical Engineering, Rustam Ismagilov, who will speak to us on the subject of diagnostics for global health and antimicrobial stewardship. Rustam was born in the Russian city of Ufa, 800 miles east of Moscow, just west of the southern Ural Mountains. He earned his first degree in chemistry from the Russian Academy of Sciences in Moscow, then moved to the United States to the University of Wisconsin, where he earned his PhD for studies of electron transfer in simple organic molecules under the supervision of Stephen Nelson. After postdoctoral work at Harvard with George Whitesides, Rustam joined the faculty of the University of Chicago in 2001. There he established an important new laboratory for the study of complex chemical and biological systems with a specific interest in the development of sensitive, low-cost methods for molecular measurement. Those methods have enabled powerful new approaches to critically important problems in human health and have provided some of the key innovations that underlie two new companies, Raindance Technologies in Billerica, Massachusetts, and Slipchip Corporation in Menlo Park, California. We were delighted to be able to persuade Rustam to join us at Caltech about five years ago, and it's been exciting to watch his research continue to grow in scope and impact. It's my pleasure to introduce Rustam as this evening's Watson lecturer. What a great privilege to be here tonight. And while I have the pleasure of speaking in front of you, I really want to emphasize that the credit for all of this goes to the group, uh, both former members and current members of the lab that actually did all of this work. I also want to emphasize um, all of the funding agencies, both federal funding agencies and Caltech funding agencies that um, feed this talented group of people and provide them with equipment and supplies, and also emphasize our um, exciting collaboration with Romney Humphreys at UCLA, who's been a fantastic person to work with. The dream I've had for many years is to figure out how to do distributed quantitative measurements by anyone, anywhere on this map. And it may seem like um, a real surprise even to me thinking about where we were 20 years ago, but today, pretty much on any spot on this map, you can take a video of your cat and upload it to YouTube. And that, of course, is an amazing part of human progress, but I really, I really feel strongly we have to be able to do better than that and do other things that enable human progress. And what we cannot do today on this map um, in a very distributed way is get really high quality quantitative molecular measurements. And those measurements are really critical for a number of uh, problems facing humanity today, from global health to healthcare in both uh, pediatric and emergency settings to understanding and protecting food and water security to dealing with pandemics to dealing with antibiotic resistance. There are two problems that we're really facing here. One is this capability of uh, access. So we need to be able to distribute these kinds of measurements throughout the world. Second is obviously affordability. While in our world we can afford a lot, we still really struggling with the healthcare costs that are now at 16% of GDP, and there are many parts of the world where we can't do that many things at all, so we don't have infrastructure to do any measurements at all of the sort I'm talking about. And of course, these are multifaceted problems, and there are lots of issues that we would need to solve, but I'm a strong believer that science and innovation is really an important component of progress there. Let me be a little bit more specific and tell you what exactly is missing. And what exactly is missing is this ability to do quantitative ultra-sensitive measurements of molecules, whether those molecules come from a human body or from 
a particular microbe of interest. We really can't do that outside of clinical labs. What we can do outside of a clinical lab is something like a pregnancy test. It's a wonderful technology. It's been around since the 70s. We've now used this technology to address many, many problems, not only pregnancy testing, but many pathogens can be tested with things like this. But uh, you have to remember that this is a qualitative test. It's a yes or no test, which is perfectly fine for a pregnancy test. You know, the clinical question isn't how pregnant is a particular person. <laughs> the clinical question is yes or no, pregnant, not pregnant. However, as I will point out um, in the next few slides, many problems we're facing actually do require a quantitative measurement. We can do them in central laboratories using really complicated and amazingly, um, quite amazing equipment, but that's neither distributed, distributable nor affordable right now to really um, deploy at scale. Just to give you one example of where quantitative measurements are critical, it's a measurement of HIV viral load. That's HIV is a condition that impacts over 30 million people on this planet. It is distributed throughout the world. It doesn't affect just the developed countries. There are actually quite a high burden in the developing countries. And amazingly enough, science and technology um, made these giant leaps in treatment of HIV, and now we have drugs that will essentially treat um, HIV successfully and main, uh, maintain people um, reasonably healthy for long times. What WHO is really, really concerned is measurements of viral load. So it's a quantitative measurement that requires you to know how many molecules of viral RNA are there per milliliter of blood plasma in this patient. And the reason it's so important, the reason it's so important to know not only whether the molecules are there, but also how many, is because that's how the treatment is monitored. So if you look at the progression of uh, HIV, uh, once it's detected, hopefully early enough, antiretroviral therapies are delivered, and that drops this parameter called viral load, that's the number of molecules of virus, viral RNA per milliliter of blood plasma, drops down to a low level, ideally below detectable, but depending on the country and the healthcare system, typically there is a threshold number, anywhere from 500 copies to 10,000 copies per milliliter, um, that would be considered a successful treatment. However, you have to watch this all the time because as soon as it starts going up, that means the virus has started evolving resistance to this drug. And this is a real issue, and WHO has looked into this very carefully, and they've concluded that this testing of viral load and then subsequent switch of therapy going to second-line therapies is really critical. Um, if no testing is done, there is a very high prevalence of transmitted drug resistance, and as, the more you test and the, the more you act on this, the more you're able to suppress it. WHO estimates on the order of $7 billion in healthcare costs on these second-line therapies um, that are incurred today because we are here, not here, in the majority of the world. And they also point out that the testing, viral load testing by today's technologies is very, very expensive on the order of $5 billion annually if we could do it, but in fact, we can't. So we don't have technologies that can be distributed throughout the world. A similar problem is with hepatitis C, uh, HCV. It's also a global epidemic. The prevalence is quite distributed. There are even more people impacted. It's on an order of 100 million people in the world and about 3 million in the US. And it's a problem that impacts not just the sub-Saharan Africa, it's a problem that impacts us very directly. So we've made, as a society, amazing progress in treating HCV today. In fact, you can cure it, but uh, it's quite expensive to do it. So it's $84,000 for a 12-week course, which works out about $1,000 per pill per day. And um, it becomes a really important for our, even our healthcare system to pay close attention and understand 
which patients are cured after eight weeks of treatment, which patients are cured after 12, and which patients might need a different therapy. So it's, again, the same exact problem. We need to be able to do viral load measurements very rapidly and expensively. And I can keep going on and on and on about these examples where it's not just detection, but a quantitative measurement that's critical. Another example is a traumatic brain injury where just a few biomarkers specific to the brain go out of the brain through blood-brain barrier into the bloodstream and then become detected. Um, potentially, if we had such technologies um, to diagnose traumatic brain injury, we actually can't do that today at all, uh, with, even with fairly complicated and sophisticated um, central lab-based instruments. So I certainly don't need to argue at this point that this ability to make measurements that can make, uh, create approaches that can be distributed and quantitative is really critical. Let me come back to this slide and uh, just start thinking about why is it so difficult? Why is it so easy to do this and why is it hard to do that? Like, and if you think about it again, this is a yes, no test, it's qualitative and it is very robust and it's really remarkable. You can take a pregnancy test at 65 Fahrenheit, you can take a text pregnancy test at 85 Fahrenheit, you can take a pregnancy test after it's been sitting in the trunk of your car for uh, a couple of weeks, and it will still work. It will still give you a yes, no answer. The lines might not be as bright, or it might take you one minute instead of 50 seconds, but you're gonna get the right answer. So it's a very robust test, and this is intrinsically why we're able to do it in such a distributed fashion. Let's think about what happens here. So to do these amazing measurements that are done in central labs, we have to do something quite difficult. We take molecules of targets, uh, for example, a target nucleic acid, and to make it really sensitive, we do something amazing. We amplify them by an exponential amplification process, for example, a polymerase chain reaction or more modern isothermal methods, and that gives us a billion-fold increase in number of molecules. And if we watch the progress of that billion or even trillion in some cases fold amplification, and then we watch it carefully over time, and as soon as it reaches a threshold, we say, aha, I have my, uh, I reached my threshold. And then we carefully think about how long did it take us to get there, and we extrapolate back that billion or trillion fold and calculate how many molecules must have we started with to get to that point. So as you can imagine, this is uh, not necessarily a robust process, in part because any errors in our assumptions about the kinetics of this process, how it proceeds, also amplify exponentially. So whatever errors I make in amplification can be amplified exponentially as well. So if everything is perfect, it works. And we can go to the clinic and do these measurements. And amazingly enough, I'm still fascinated by that it actually works in people's hands you get the right answer. But as soon as you start not doing it exactly the right way, you take it out of that central lab, you start doing it at the wrong temperature or with old reagents, it doesn't work as well. And oftentimes, if you're trying to get a quantitative answer, it just doesn't work. So we thought that it would be really interesting to try to get to the best of both worlds. Can we essentially do something like this where we take the sample containing molecules of interest? Can we break it up into lots of little compartments of volumes. And then can we do something like this on each one of these compartments? And what I mean is that if I have 100 molecules here in this tube that I'm trying to measure, and I break that, vol that tube into 1,000 little volumes, I will have 100 volumes that have molecules and 900 molecules of uh, volumes that don't, okay? And then if I can do this, qualitative test on each one of these volumes, all I have to do is just count the number of positives. And so this is an experimental example of us doing this, and we get this uh, array of green dots. A green dot means there was a molecule there, at least one, and no green dot means there wasn't a molecule there. Okay? And so this approach, um, we thought, would be much more robust, a much more robust way of doing measurements. And Essentially, again, the idea is that if I'm interested in m counting those green triang uh, blue triangles, I can break up this large volume into a series of little tiny volumes and then detect each of these blue guys individually and say, aha, I have three positives. So because I'm now doing a qualitative yes-no test, sort of like a pregnancy test on each one of these 
we thought, hey, this might be actually much more robust. And one other uh, side benefit of this is that if I have an impurity that completely messes up that, this process in the tube, that this red brick here, it is likely to end up in some other volume and not interfere with my process. So we had good reasons to think that this might work, but of course, we had to have a way to actually do this in practice. And one way by which this can be done is by using this technology called microfluidics. So essentially, it's a series of science and technology that allows us to control fluid volumes on very small scales. So this is a movie from Helen Song, uh, my former student, that shows formation of little droplets. These are aqueous streams. Uh, imagine that this is your sample and this is your reagent. This is a stream of fluorocarbon that's not miscible with the stream. We can make little volumes and run reactions in them. And as always, when we start doing these things, we find all kinds of fascinating stuff. For example, here, you will find, you will, as if you pay attention to these little guys, you find that as they proceed down the channel, they start not mixed, but by the time they exit, they're pretty much all mixed. There's something odd happening here, and that's because Helen designed this to be mixing by a very particular mechanism called chaotic advection. So it turns out that each one of these droplets is having a chaotic flow inside. So if you were to take two points uh, close together inside one of these droplets and watch them over time, their trajectories would diverge exponentially, which is a characteristic of chaos. But you can look at these guys, they're also doing exactly the same thing, one after another. So this is this very weird beast that you see on these small scales called deterministic chaos. And uh, this is just one example of many, many interesting things that you find when you start going down to new regimes and new volumes. And in fact, this work was um, uh, Helen and Josh and many other people uh, have pushed it forward and published a number of papers. It led to actually the first commercial uh, clinical application of microfluidics done by Raindance Technologies, collaboration between Raindance Technologies and Myriad, where they developed a, uh, basically an evaluation for cancer patients to determine um, analyze their genetics and determine their susceptibility to particular cancers. And I take great pride in thinking about things like this where we start with very basic questions. Like how do we control flows on small scale? How do we run lots and lots of little reactions to seeing later, and in fact, it's quite later. So this announcement of their collaboration was 10 years after the paper was published, um, see these things impact people. We moved <clears throat> forward, as we're thinking about these systems, we realized it would be really nice for these particular questions to have a technology that handles volumes in parallel instead of sequentially. And a um, number of students in my lab worked on this technology called SlipChip that allows you to essentially program fairly arbitrarily manipulations of fluid volumes into two pieces of plastic. And you, then you execute this program by sliding them relative to one another, so hence the name SlipChip. I'll play you a movie in a second, but essentially this is just an AutoCAD animation showing something very simple. The program here is fill these five wells using these ducts in the opposing plate and then run reactions um, using the sample in these five wells with reagents in these five wells. So you can see that I slide them together. That allows me to fill the fluid and then as I slip, these guys forward, I expose them to reagents, and then the reaction starts. And this is, of course, a very simple program. We can do more complicated ones. You can imagine that uh, you could run multi-step programs. In this case, it's the same exact thing, except we're going to do two steps. We're going to fill. We're going to slide once to initiate the first reaction. And then we're going to slide uh, once more to initiate the second. And that turned out to be really an important capability. I won't talk about it today, for, but for many single molecule measurements, we found that this ability to do multi-step manipulations on individual molecules gives you comp new capabilities that you couldn't dream about before this. So to implement this particular idea of taking a sample, breaking it up into lots of little volumes, and running uh, detection amplification reactions, we designed a simple chip shown here. Essentially, it's very similar to the animation you just saw where you can fill 
fluid paths that are spanning these two plates. You can see that these wells overlap between these two plates that allows the fluid to flow. And as we slip, we create compartments. So that's not particularly complicated. The complicated part was, um, can we actually do it? And can we do it in some way that would be actually useful? And we were funded by DARPA to do this work. And they asked us a very simple question. They said, well, this would be really amazing if it worked, but how can you convince us that it would actually work? So I spent quite a bit of time thinking about this. And um, fortunately, we were able to find a six-year-old volunteer who uh, was able to demonstrate that this would actually be possible. And the concern that we and everybody else had was the following. Well, you can have this idea for a chip that you can do interesting things, but if that chip requires a truck full of lasers and other equipment to actually do the experiment, this is becoming less useful. So we had to con convince them that we can actually take the chip and in a very simple way show that manipulations can be done without a lot of external equipment. And this is how you do slip chip experiment. First you get the sample. Then you put it in the hole. Then you cover it with the top. Then you wait until it goes to the end. You can see that this chip is injection molded and molding is not perfect, so these streams go at different rates, but students designed really clever mechanism here to make everybody wait for one another, not overfill. Then you slip. And now it's done. And when we, when we did these experiments, uh, we, uh, we were able to see the first evidence that we were on the right track. We saw that when we ran these reactions, detected molecules for a particular isothermal amplification chemistry called RPA, we ran them at 37, 39, 42, and we got the same answer. So within uh, statistical error, we're getting the same answer. If you do that experiment in a tube, you'd be about 100 to 1,000 times off. So it really doesn't work, and it's very sensitive to temperature. But here, we were getting the right answer, so we got very excited. And we then looked at it in many different contexts. We looked at robustness to temperature, to reagents, to imaging, and many other things. Let me just show you one example using a different chemistry that runs at different temperatures at, at 60 degrees, where if we take our digital single molecule counting approach and we compare two concentrations, in this case, um, they're different by twofold. And by the way, twofold, resolving this twofold difference is roughly what you need to do to monitor viral load, because clinicians start making decisions when viral load goes up two to threefold. So twofold is a really good test. And look at this. You can do it at 57, you can do it at 60, you can do it at 63, and then when you go to uh, a lower concentration, you get um, lower counts, and then regardless of which temperature you use for which measurement, you can still very reliably call the difference. If you don't do it this way, if you do it um, in a tube by standard technology, you can't, it's really difficult to tell that there is, this is twofold different. In fact, these temperature variations really dominate the signal. We pushed it further and we looked at, um, we looked at robustness to other things like imaging and automated analysis, and notice that in this case, all we are trying to ask is, is this dot green or not? We're not asking exactly how green it is. We're not trying to catch it to be 5% greener than the other one. So it turned out that we could use fairly simple technologies like a cell phone to do this quantification, and we were getting really good data. And then uh, we ran an experiment where we sort of put all insults into the same box, and we changed the temperatures, we changed the imaging quality, we, changed the, we introduced automated analysis, and we could still distinguish distinguish this twofold difference between two concentrations. So then we really knew that this was, um, we were on the right track and we were detecting, we were doing something that's uh, gonna be robust. And 
at that time, uh, our uh, DARPA project was moving forward, and you know, we showed these data, and we were uh, we was told, "Well, guys, this is really great, but does it like actually work? And how you know how would you envision doing this?" So, you know, fortunately, again, <laughs> you know, we had a five-year-old volunteer at that time. And uh, we were able to do um, single molecule counting of this viral RNA. This is how you count molecules on slip chip. This chip did reaction towards molecules from a virus. It should find about 380 molecules. You take the chip and put it into a shoe box. Cover it up. Then you put the phone on top. Tap the screen. Then you take a picture. The picture goes to a computer. The computer counts the molecules and sends you the answer, and that's it. And here, um, you can see that uh, this is a screenshot of a remote server that my students set up, and it shows that this is the picture with all the fiducial marks that the computer was able to get. It found all of the green dots, counted them, and sent an email that goes to a different phone uh, that says, hey, I found 368 molecules based on post statistics, and that all the quality controls have passed. Pretty close. And so you can see that um, it is possible to do this. And of course, this is not, um, we've done a lot of work since then. We were able to get rid of the shoebox and we can use it with a variety of cell phones by uh, switching to different detection chemistries that um, simplify the process further. And a large amount of work has been done by um, us in collaboration with uh, Slipchip Corporation that uh, spent a lot of time figuring out how to, do, um, how to do integration of this technology with sample preparation. Now, and um, we've, as I've mentioned, we've done a lot of work that has been published, including developing other chips that allow you to do very high dynamic range measurements with uh, multiplexing and many other technological innovations. And I'm really, really excited by this because I think we are on the path to impacting that viral load measurement problem in a significant way. Let me, so we talked about one aspect of global health and viral load measurements. Let me talk about the other corner of this problem, antibiotic resistance. It's not a controversial statement that antibiotic use, medical use, changed humanity. If you think about mortality rate from bloodstream infections by Staphylococcus, pre-antibiotic was 80%. It was almost a death sentence. Introduction of penicillin dropped it down to below 30. And in fact, this was a very important part of World War II. However, if you look at what happens as soon as that penicillin was introduced, not surprisingly, just like we saw with uh, HIV virus, resistant microorganisms evolve. Penicillin resistant Staph aureus, uh, mortality rate goes up. Methicillin is introduced, mortality drops back down. It continues to stay low as long as people are infected with the methicillin susceptible Staph aureus. However, if they're infected with methicillin resistant Staph aureus or MRSA, mortality creeps up, and the only reason it's not up here is that we've also introduced vancomycin, which is, was used as a drug of last resort, and that was, able, that was used to keep the mortality rates lower. However, when vancomycin resistant Staph aureus appeared, that was a real, real problem. And it's not limited to Staph infections. It's not limited to penicillin. If you look at this plot showing introduction of antibiotics by year, when versus when the resistance evolved, you see two disturbing aspects. One, the number of things here is exactly the same as the number of things here. In other words, for every single antibiotic we've introduced, we have detected clinical resistance. And in fact, 
of the most recently introduced antibiotics took very little. The second troubling part is that look at this gap where no new classes of antibiotics were introduced. We can talk about that offline for why that is and what we should have done differently. That's not the point of the story, but it is a very important aspect. So <clears throat> essentially, what this tells us is that we are running out of antibiotics, and many agencies, WHO, CDC, governments, including our government and UK and many other countries, are talking about this uh, as an impending crisis. So already in the US, there are 23,000 deaths due to antibiotic-resistant infections. Worldwide, it's on the order of 700,000. And uh, if we continue with the status quo, if we do what we're doing today, and I'll talk about what we're doing today in a second, we're going to be um, at a much higher number. And these projections are certainly difficult to extrapolate uh, very precisely or accurately, but it's been estimated that we'll have on the order of 10 million uh, deaths due to antibiotic resistant infections by 2050. For comparison, today, worldwide mortality due to cancer, diabetes, diarrheal diseases are shown here. So this is a really big number, and we really have to start thinking about this. If you think about economic impact, it's also quite significant in the EU. It's over a billion dollars in the US. It's up CDC quotes 55. Uh, that includes both direct medical costs, but also lost productivity. These numbers, again, very hard to get exactly right, but they're very large numbers. Incidentally, 55 billion is much larger than NIH and NSF funding budgets combined. So this is a really big problem. And certainly, there is a lot of um, projected loss GDP. So people talk about this as you know, return back to the pre-antibiotic era where a simple cut, uh, a simple infection can be fatal, and we certainly can't do surgeries that we're taking for granted today, for example, dental work, or we can't do chemotherapy and we can't uh, really do transplants because those require on antibiotics to maintain um, <clears throat> our health while our immune system is suppressed. So this is a real uh, problem. Let's think about the root cause for a few minutes. This picture captures quite a bit of it. So it shows total antibiotic use versus emergence of a particular staph pneumonia resistant infections. And the correlation is not perfect, but it's quite striking. So antibiotics are in the category of the more we use them, the more we lose them. It's not surprising once you think about it because in fact, that's how the world works. Antibiotics were here well before us. They're made by our microorganisms, and microorganisms figure out how to deal with them by evolving resistance. In fact, if you go back to penicillin that Alexander Fleming um, discovered and received the Nobel Prize in 1945 for his discovery of penicillin, the experiment he did was somewhat an accidental one. He observed that there was a colony of a fungus growing on his plate, and that colony of a fungus was inhibiting bacterial colonies. So bacterial colonies are these little white dots showing here, and you can see that they're less pronounced around this penicillin, penicillin colony. So Fleming hypothesized that it was making something that was diffusing through this agar plate and killing bacteria, and that's how he ultimately, with the help of many other people, was able to uh, make penicillin. But the, the main point here is that this communication among microorganisms, making antibiotics, figuring out how to deal with them by evolving resistance has been there before us and it will be there after us. If you th look at th this picture, uh, there are two really important points here. One, we can use similar experiments to Fleming's to test for it, antibiotic resistance. We can take little paper disks, throw them on plates, and observe whether a particular organism is resistant or susceptible. For example, this particular bug is resistant to ampicillin because it grows up right up to the disc. So this pale yellow growth means the bacteria growing. And this clearing zone around this disc indicates that this bacterium is susceptible to what is uh, essentially Bactrim, a mixture of two antibiotics. That's the first point. We can test for it. The second point that is really important is that it's not all or nothing. So any given organism will be resistant to some and susceptible to others. And that's just dependent on evolutionary history of that particular strain, what's it seen, and what it had to do to get to that particular patient. And that's uh, something we should keep in mind. So 
I'm going to make an argument here that this testing shown on this slide, figuring out which antibiotic can be used for a particular patient is the really key bottleneck in dealing with antibiotic resistance. We can do it by doing these experiments that are very similar to Fleming's. This is another type of experiment that uses paper strips instead of paper discs, uh, but it's exactly the same idea. And the problem with this experiment is that it's excruciatingly slow. It takes over a day to grow up the particular organism from a sample uh, obtained from a patient, and then it takes another day or two to get this result because it requires many, many cell divisions and growth of um, bacteria around these disks. So we can't really be doing this. It's too slow. And because we can't be doing this on the clinical timescale, we have a real problem. Think about bloodstream infections that we talked about uh, <clears throat> on the previous slide. So if you administer correct antibiotic right away at zero hours, the survival rate, as we mentioned before, is on the order of 80%. This is great. However, if you were to wait for all of that growth, you'd be here at 24 to 36 hours. The expected survival rate is close to zero. So we can't really wait to the three days. So what do we do? Well, we do what we can. So the physician would prescribe an antibiotic, the broadest possible spectrum thing that is likely to cover everything that might be in this patient and hope for the best. And then when the results come back, you know, hopefully it was the right antibiotic, and if it's not, you know, maybe we can switch it. We have faced the same problem in other less uh, critical care settings, for example, in pediatrics, so just any uh, visits to your doctor with um, lung and uh, bronchitis, where we really can't wait for two to three days to test for antibiotic susceptibility so that your physician would prescribe something that the physician thinks is the right thing to prescribe. And um, I'll come back to how that is done in just a second because it's a very important point. Um, and these visits uh, to your doctor are actually really, really common. Just take one of them, urinary tract infections. Um, there are over 8 million of, the, of office visits due to UTIs. There are lots of emergency room visits. And it's not something to take lightly because uh, if urinary tract infection progresses, it can spread to kidneys, and then from there it can lead to sepsis, especially in patients who might already be in the hospital. Um, and women are at greatest risk for these. So the point is that both in critical care settings and in somebody just coming to their doctor with a child saying, we need to do something here, we have to face the same problem. Doctor has to prescribe something right away but we can't really be waiting for two to three days. So what we do instead is we have this guideline-based approach, which is done in the hope that we essentially gonna treat everybody the same way. What we do is CDC publishes guidelines and says, well, we've done a lot of studies using these very slow methods, and we figured out that for this patient population in this geographic area, this particular antibiotic will work for more than 95% of people. Use that. And of course, uh, that gets used. However, resistance will invariably creep up. And then CDC says, wait a minute, resistance is more than 5%. Stop using this one. Switch to the next bigger and better one, okay? And then when that invariably runs out, we switch to the next one. And this is essentially how we run out of antibiotics. We don't test for what is actually needed for any given patient. We have guidelines, we do sort of treat everybody the same, and we escalate step by step. And that's a really big problem. So, because it leads to this overuse of broad spectrum antibiotics and we're running out. And this is this classic issue of the tragedy of the commons, where we think we don't think really about antibiotics as a shared resource. If I get treated with a broad spectrum antibiotic, somebody else might get a has an increased chance of getting an antibiotic resistant infection. Okay? And it's kind of the same problem as clean air problem. We all agree that clean air is important. We take a lot of steps to make sure there is less pollution because we collectively agree that it's important and Air is a resource shared by all. We don't think that way about antibiotics, but we should. Because antibiotics are that unique resource. We're run, running out of it, and we've got to do something about it. And 
it's pretty obvious what needs to be done. And this, um, I'll give you just one example of drug-resistant gonorrhea as, as something that CDC is very, very concerned about. It's on the list of top three threats currently in the United States. And um, <clears throat> it's, we essentially, we've gone through that series of treatments and we are on the very, very, very last regimen. We don't have anything else in the pipeline. And we already see clinical resistance to that very last regimen. So CDC calls it an urgent threat, and they're saying, look, we gotta do something about this. So by this, in this guideline-driven world, we're done. However, if you think about this, there's an amazing fact. Only 16% of the drug resistant, of, of gonorrhea strains circulating today are resistant uh, to penicillin. That same penicillin that Alexander Fleming got a Nobel Prize for in 1945. Think about it. On one hand, we're in the world that says we're done, that said we have no more options. On the other hand, if you were to actually test people one by one and give them what they need, you can treat 85% 80, of people out there with penicillin that Alexander Fleming figured out many years ago. So, Switching the, the, that paradigm is going to be really, really critical. And I'm not the only one recognizing this, of course. So there are lots of initiatives um, on this. And uh, in the UK, the Longitude Prize was announced to, de for, to develop very rapid point-of-care antibiotic resistance test as number one problem facing humanity today, um, you know, above all other problems uh, in energy and health and many others. So this is clearly very important. And just to remind you, this is how we do it today. Uh, primarily, this takes many days, but, and this is the gold standard. However, the beauty of this method is that it works and it gives you what we call antibiotic resistance phenotype. That is, it actually tells you whether this particular organism is susceptible or resistant to an antibiotic. You don't need any other information. You do this test, you have the answer. We have thought about this eight years ago and came up with an approach to cut down the time in this test from days to hours. And there are, there's a lot of interesting activity in this area today, but I still think hours is too long. What we really need is about half an hour, something that can be done within a patient visit. And that is something that would be really exciting. The alternative method that is used not as widely is so-called genotypic test. It's a really cool approach. Essentially, it, it says, if we detect a particular gene, for example, MEK-A gene in Staphylococcus aureus, we will be able to predict antibiotic resistance. We don't actually measure resistance susceptibility, but we make an educated guess. And we can do that for Staph aureus and MEK-A, and in fact, that's how we de can determine susceptibility to methicillin, that antibiotic we talked about a few slides ago, but it really is a problematic approach for many organisms because if you look at gram negatives and you look at genes responsible for penicillin resistance, we know many, many thousands of those, and it's just impractical to test for all of them today. So what we would really love to have is some sort of best of both worlds. We want to read out the phenotype. We want to give these bugs an antibiotic and see what they do in response, but we want to do it really fast. And so we thought, hey, well, we have this amazing single molecule counting approach. Can we, would that be the right thing to do here? And <clears throat> the experiment is, uh, as you can guess, is fairly straightforward in design. We're gonna take a, a clinical sample, we're gonna split it into two tubes, we're gonna <clears throat> add an antibiotic to one with a brown cap, we're gonna not add the antibiotic to the other, the blue, we'll add a little bit of food to both to make sure these bugs are happy. And then we're gonna wait for a short amount of time, like 15 minutes. And 15 minutes is really amazing because it's actually much less than it takes for a bacterial cell to divide. So it's a very, very fast um, experiment. And then we're gonna measure something. And the question is, what do we measure to read out that response? And what we decided to measure first was bacterial DNA. It's DNA coming from this particular pathogen <clears throat> that we're interested in. And this, was the, this cartoon shows the hypothesis, shows the prediction that we would get. If this bug is susceptible to the antibiotic, this is what we expect. At zero time, treated and untreated, of course, is the same. It's, uh, let's say you get five copies of DNA of this pathogen. But at 15 minutes, you would see that the treated guy is not replicating DNA, and it stays 
at same five, but the untreated one is happily replicating DNA and you go up to, let's say, seven in this cartoon. So by detecting this difference between treated and untreated, you know that this particular bug is susceptible. And in fact, that works. And this is an experimental result showing that it's possible. So we see exactly, um, we see data exactly congruent with this prediction at 15 minutes. The untreated bacterium replicates its DNA. The treated bacterium does not because um, it is susceptible. If we look at the resistant bug, both treated and untreated happily replicate DNA because it's resistant because it just doesn't care. It goes on with its life. And we looked at this for several antibiotics relevant to urinary tract infection. There are four of them. We looked at Cipro. That works. We see this difference between untreated and treated. We looked at nitrofurantoin. The same thing, big difference between <clears throat> untreated and treated. We looked at sulfur, uh, which is essentially Bactrim, same difference. And, but I said that there were four, uh, right? So, and I'll come back to that. But this was really amazing because these, some of these differences are quite subtle. But by taking advantage of this single molecule counting, we can actually pick up these differences with incredibly high statistical significance. So we really know what, what that answer is. And uh, now let's come back to the fourth antibiotic, which was a beta-lactam amoxicillin. That gave, gave us a result where there was no difference among the, all of these lines because we know that beta-lactams do not affect DNA replication at all. They interfere with cell wall biosynthesis. So <clears throat> we did not, uh, it was continued to replicate the DNA. But then uh, students in the lab asked the question of what would actually happen if we didn't break apart all of the DNA into pieces, and we actually looked at those DNA chunks, complexes, a little bit more carefully in their intact form. And what they found is quite striking. So when you treat a, a susceptible organism with uh, these beta-lactams, if they are untreated, untreated, they replicate their DNA, those DNA chromosomes segregate, and you get two large pieces. And when you do the counting, you get two counts. When you do not do that, um, when you expose them to antibiotic, and even though replication is not affected, and you still generate all of the DNA, that DNA is all clumped together. It can't quite separate. So when we do the counting, we find only one signal, because it's just one chunk uh, that we end up counting. And we can do the control experiment where we shear all of these samples to basically break them up into pieces, and we find that there is no difference between, um, uh, between treated and untreated, indicating that indeed it's not really the amount of DNA, but the structure of DNA. It's a little bit technical, but the reason I'm bringing this up is that, in fact, nothing like this was known about bacterial DNA replication in response to antibiotics. And in fact, we had a project, they have a project in the lab where we're looking at something similar for eukaryotic, for mammalian cells. We're trying to understand how DNA, how DNA is structured, uh, how um, DNA complex is, uh, complexes form inside a, a mammalian human cell or mouse cell. And these kinds of results uh, immediately fed back to the project and um, generated a lot of really fascinating questions about structure of DNA in these microorganisms. And the reason I'm emphasizing that is because I found to be, just like in that case of chaotic advection, I find this to be really a pattern. When we try to do something really, really hard, we invariably find that something doesn't work. We have to go look at why, and we find new science. And this is what really keeps me up at night, and that's why I'm excited um, about these projects. And uh, now we can, so we have ways to detect uh, antibiotic response in, after 15 minutes of exposure. Now, let me remind you that this can be done really, really quickly. And here's a movie of the, one of these amplifications. This is in minutes. And you'll see that each one of these dots is a molecule. And you will notice that most of these guys pop up by about four to five minutes. And they're not all behaving the same. And that's also fascinating science for why molecules that should be the same don't behave the same way. And we're thinking about that. But for all practical purposes, it's really, really exciting because we can count the molecules in about 40, majority of them in about four to five minutes. The way we do that is we plot these um, intensities over time. We, again, look at when they reach a threshold. We can plot out 
this curve that essentially says how many molecules have reached a particular threshold and intensity over time. And you can see that there's a large uh, sharp spike at around five minutes. And then we can do that in our uh, experiment with both treated and untreated um, samples. So in this case, what we're doing is we're taking a sample from a clinical patient with a urinary tract infection. We are splitting it up into two. We're treating one with antibiotic. We're not treating the other. And we are running that experiment. And look, we can do 15-minute exposure. We can do three-minute sample prep. We can do six-minute amplification. And all in with all of the transfer steps and everything, in under 30 minutes, we can make the call that this particular isolate is susceptible. And that is really making me very excited because it looks like we have a path to something that can actually work on the clinically relevant timescales. We can do this in half an hour. And what also makes me very excited thinking about this is that it raises a lot of fascinating questions. It turns out very little is known about how bacteria respond to, sh to very short exposures to antibiotics. And there's lots of interesting biology. There are lots of fundamental questions about limits of this approach. How many cells do we really have to have on this? How many molecules do we have to count to make a conclusive decision and, and so forth? So to me, this is opening up a really fascinating area of research that has potential for a really great impact and whether it's impact on patients with sepsis in clinical, um, critical clinical situations, whether it's impact on these community-acquired infections in pediatrics and other settings, and addressing this question of antibiotic susceptibility testing in the context of antibiotic stewardship. How do we really manage this precious resource that we have, and how do you avoid the tragedy of the commons? Like, all of that is appearing on the horizon. I'm very excited by that. And I am also really um, fascinated by going back to this point of being able to do these high quality measurements anywhere by anyone in a very robust way. I told you a little bit about our work on global health and viral load measurements, which are also driven by evolution of resistance in uh, viral infections. Uh, I told you a little bit about our work on this antibiotic susceptibility testing, but I am really convinced there is a lot, there are a lot of opportunities everywhere else on the spectrum from, again, thinking about other global health problems to biosecurity to food and water safety to monitoring viral pandemics. And what I also want to point out is that this is really exciting because of this interface between new science and really big problems, and that's the kind of thing that keeps me up at night. But at the same time, it's very, very challenging. And I'd be the first to admit that in academia, we're not very well set up to deal with this because I can't really, in my lab with the people I have, solve this problem on a global scale. So we need to figure out how to interface with other agencies like the FDA and WHO. We need to figure out how to interface with the industry properly. And that's, uh, I'm really grateful to President Rosenbaum who's thinking about how to do that. How do we do that sort of translational work in the most meaningful way? How do we put Caltech at the forefront of that work? And it's not a trivial question, but something we're thinking about very hard. I really want to finish by thanking again all of the students who did this work that I talked about, both former students and current students. I want to emphasize the funding, the federal funding is absolutely critical in this, but also this internal funding, for example, Jacobs Institute for Molecular Engineering for Medicine is an, uh, provided funding for the antibiotic work well before any federal funding agency would take the risk. And that really enables us to work with um, Romney Humphrey and her very, very talented colleagues. I'm, again, really delighted to be here. I'm very happy to take questions. Please come to the microphones. Thank you.